I wanted to do something a little different for you this year, something a little special. I, one thing that I try to do is I try to start my studies pretty early in the week. I, I start by Monday. I'm already uh, putting together my sermons. And the reason why I do that is because I need to spend time with the scriptures that I'm going to teach you, right? Um, it, it can't be that I, I, I'm on a Saturday just barely studying and then Sunday I give you a message. That's not how it works. Um, and I got a reason for this. I don't know if you've ever heard of a man by the name of Leonard Ravenhill. Have you guys ever heard of Leonard Ravenhill before? I'm sure you guys have heard of Paul Washer, right? Leonard Ravenhill was a man that, that Paul Washer looked up to. And this is something that Leonard Ravenhill said. This is one of his more famous quotes. He says, um, talk to me, or, um, we should not talk to men about God until we have talked to God about men. And now he's talking about, about there, many people want to go out and they want to start preaching the word, but they don't even pray for the people that they're even talking to, right? So Leonard Ravenhill, was, he was pretty deep in his theology. He was, a, a, he was known as a man of prayer, but he goes on to say something else concerning uh, the, the Christian life. He says, he says something that I've always treasured in my heart since I've heard it. And especially for those who are going to study the Word of God and preach it, he says this, The prophets were holy men, they were lowly men, they were lonely men, they were men who walked with God and then came down to earth in the, in the power of the Spirit of God. But then he quotes a man by the name of Ebenezer Brown, and he elaborates more on what he said, and this is what what he meant by what I just quoted for you. He says, I live five days in eternity. I live five days in eternity and then come down to earth and share the spoil with my congregation and my church. I spend five days or six days, whatever the time may be, in study and in prayer. And I'm spending that in eternity. And then I come down from eternity to share it with you all. Now this, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this is where every preacher ought to be. Every preacher ought to be there. Engulfed in the scripture you're going to teach. I got a reason for that also. Today we're going to consider an Old Testament account in Genesis 29. and In this biblical account we're going to learn about the patriarch uh, Jacob's life. We will learn about him, we will learn about his uncle Laban, we will learn about Laban's two daughters, Rachel and Leah, who become the mothers of Israel. This is a very important text, and you know, we, sometimes we might read through this and skip over the deeper meaning of it. But the reason I mention Labor, uh, Raven Hill is because I, I've spent a whole week in Genesis 29. I have the privilege to do that because I get to teach you guys, but... A whole week I've been, I've been getting to know the, the foundation of the story. A whole week getting to know the characters of the story. The whole, a whole week seeing the pain that was caused by other people uh, and the affliction of that pain in this story. So I get to draw close to it. But I'm going to share that with you this morning. And so I get to put myself there and I get to gain a, a greater and a new appreciation for the riches that are found in this Old Testament book of Genesis. Now, Mother's Day is a great time throughout the year to draw out great women in the Bible, right? And, and you, get, you all know that there's a, there were many women of faith, of the faith, in the Bible. We always hear of the Proverbs 31 woman, right? The Proverbs 31 woman was a virtuous woman. But not only do we, have, do we only hear of her, we hear of Hannah, we hear of Sarah, we hear of Rebecca, Rachel, one of the women that's found in our story today, but we also hear of Ruth and Esther and etc. There's a lot of women of, of the faith. But it's not very often and even in, in, some of you have that John MacArthur book of the, what's it called, babe? The Twelve? The what? Uh, the Twelve, what was that? Is it extraordinary 
extraordinary yeah. women, 12 extraordinary women. And in that book, I mean, it's fantastic. You see these women, you see the depth of their story, but still, you did not hear of Leah, right? Did you hear of Leah on there? I, I don't know how to say that, Leah or Leah. Yeah. I feel like I'm, saying, I'm not talking about Star Wars when they say Leah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I say Leah, you can call her Leah. But, um, so it's very often, not very often we talk about Leah, right? She's not very popular in the Bible. And although there are many things that we can learn from Genesis 29, our focus today is going to be on Leah. But we've got to build up a foundation to it. And um, so again, I, I've had, I spent all week getting to know these characters. And Leah, out of all these characters, was the one that caught my heart. She's the one that captivated my heart. And I know that she's going to captivate yours or capture your heart this morning. So if you're not familiar with the story, Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, right? Those are the patriarchs. The Lord called Abraham out of the land of Haran and made him a promise that in him all the families of the earth would be blessed. Abraham had a son named Ishmael by who? Hagar. But the son of the promise was not Ishmael, the firstborn, by Hagar. The son of the promise was the son of Sarah, who was considered the firstborn. His name was Isaac. And a wife was chosen for Isaac from Abraham's brother Nahor, whose, whose daughter was Rebekah. Isaac and Rebekah had twins. The firstborn of that marriage was who? Esau. And the second born of those twins was Jacob. But even in that family, it was not Esau who was chosen, but Jacob. Now why am I laboring this point to you? The reason why is because every generation of Abraham's descendants, in every generation of Abraham's descendants, there would be one child, one child. I think I was talking to you about this yesterday, brother, about the messianic seed, the messianic line. There would be one child to bear the messianic line. One child. And until, and that would continue on until one day out of all those descendants, the Messiah would come. So one of the questions we must ask is, why is Jacob in Haran the land of his great-grandfather, or his grandfather. When Rebekah was pregnant, her twins, with her twins, in Genesis 25, 23, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and listen to the promise, and the older shall serve the what? The younger. The younger. You guys know this. It was through Jacob not Esau, that the Messiah would come. If you remember the story, Isaac favored and set his affections on Esau despite what the Lord promised, despite the prophecy that God gave to him. This is important to our story because as a result of that disobedience and as a result of that favoritism, disruption and corruption entered into the family, entered into the household. Esau grew up proud and spoiled, and Jacob, and listen to this, Jacob grew up rejected and resentful, and he became a deceiver. Something we need to take note of in our story today, and at the end of Isaac's life, when it was time to give the blessing to the next head of the family, which he had his heart and affections on the oldest son, Esau, which would have been correct if, had God not chosen Jacob, at the direction of his mother, Jacob, dressed up like Esau, pretending to be Esau, and received the blessing that was intended for his brother. When Esau found out what Jacob did, he vowed to kill Jacob. You guys remember that? And what ended up happening there was Rebecca came to her son and told her to go to her 
brother's house in Haran, which was Laban, Laban's house. So Isaac and Isaac and Rebecca got together, and they Isaac ended up blessing uh, Jacob, and they sent Jacob off because Esau wanted to kill him. Now, there's something that you got to understand about this story. Jacob left everything behind. Everything behind. He couldn't enjoy the inheritance that was in that blessing for him. He couldn't enjoy his mother. He couldn't enjoy his, his father. His life became chaos. He was a deceiver. And this brings us to where we are today in our text. And today, in Genesis 29, verses 1 through 8, we find that upon being sent off, he arrives here at this well. Let's talk about this well for a moment. I'm going to read this again, just verses 1 through 8 in Genesis 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the sons of the east. He looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it, for from that well they watered the flocks. Now the stone on the mouth of the wall, or the well, was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, they would then roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place on the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, my brothers, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran. He said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Naor? And they said, we know him. And he said to them, is it, is it well with them? And they said, it is well. And here is Rachel, his daughter, coming with the sheep. And he said, behold, it is still high day. It, it, it is not time for the livestock to be gathered. Water, water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, we cannot until the, the flocks are gathered. And they roll the stone from the mouth of the wall, the well. Then we water the sheep. Now we need to understand that, uh, what we need to understand is that behind the scenes, there are no coincidences here. You might say, oh, he just, uh, Jacob just showed up and it was a coincidence. And, you know, in our day and age, everybody thinks that there's coincidences. There are no coincidences with the sovereign God. This wasn't a coincidence. As a matter of fact, God led him there. God led him there. None in what happened to Jacob with his family was a coincidence. None of what happened to Jacob going to this well was a coincidence. None of how uh, Jacob's life plays out is a coincidence. This also displays the Lord's sovereignty and divine providence. God directed the course of his, of his life. The implication is that the hand of God directed Jacob's travels. And so you can actually see it when the Lord calls him uh, back home in one of the promises. But one thing I want you to take note of is the mention of the stone that was covering this well. Now, you might think that the well was like a, a, a well nowadays where it had the surrounding walls on this well, but in this, uh, in this time, many wells were just a hole dug in the, in the ground, right? So they would put a big stone on there so nobody would fall in and, and uh, animals wouldn't fall in, things wouldn't fall into the water, corrupting the water, or... Uh, or uh, bugs going in there, and, and quite possibly it was because they wanted to regulate the use of this well. So there was this big stone that the text says that it took more than a few men to move, right? And we understand that. So we look at verse 29, this is where Jacob meets Rachel, and while he was still speaking with them in verse 9, Rachel came with her father's sheep for she was a shepherdess when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother. Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice and wept. Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. So when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his son, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Then he re related to Laban all these things. Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. 
and he stayed with him a month. Now this is a pretty interesting story right here, or part of the story, because if that stone was, was so large that it took a few men to move it, we see that in the next text that Jacob removed it himself, right? Now, this is pretty important to the story also because many agree that this was a supernatural uh, use of strength here, kind of like with Samson. And the reason why is some commentators say is Genesis 28, 15 expresses this, Behold, I am with you. This is God telling Jacob, Behold, I am, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And so commentators believe that this show of strength was to show the people that the Lord was with them. Not only that, it was also, it might have been a little show of, look at me, <laughs> right? It, it might have been a little bit of showing off to, to get his, to catch his uh, uh, cousin Rachel's attention, right? Now, this sudden exertion of strength could have been him showing that the Lord was with him or showing off, but after he watered his uncle's sheep, he kissed Rachel. Now this was not sexual by any man. He does this out of overwhelming joy because the Lord had led, them, led him to this well, to his family members. And then you see how Laban embraced him and invited him to his house. Now let's get to Jacob's agreement. And, I, and this is more of a commentary, less of a sermon, because uh, I had to fit a lot into it. But we're going to go into it. Genesis 29, verse 15 to 20. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, you should therefore serve me, or shall you serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Here's where we're going to get into the, the main part of the story. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful, beautiful of form and face. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than to give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served for seven years. He served for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Okay, now we're going to breathe for a moment. Now, everything I said up to this point was basically an introduction to the body of our story. After staying with uh, Laban, his uncle, for a month, and staying with his family, Laban is probably wondering how he's going to pay his nephew. In this time in, in antiquity, after three days, the person that was staying with his family would have to start working, right? And so Laban was looking at his nephew not as a slave. He didn't know how to pay him. He wasn't a slave, and he wasn't a hired worker. So he's trying to figure out, what am I going to do with my nephew? He was sent here to live with me, but I got to pay him. He can't be working for free, right? So he asked, he asked uh, uh, Jacob, so what, what do you think I should pay you? <laughs> And when he asked Jacob this, what do you think the first words that came out of Jacob's mouth were? He says, you can pay me with Rachel. <laughs> you can pay me with Rachel. And this is how the story begins. Now, there are some very important uh, details that are given here about these two daughters, okay? Laban had two daughters. The older was named what? Leah. The younger was Rachel. The author describes Leah as having weak eyes. What do you think about when you think about a person that has weak eyes? What do you think about? You probably think she's a squinter. <laughs> right? You probably, you, you probably think that. You probably think that she needs glasses. Well, and, and in the English language, that's what it sounds like, right? She had weak eyes. But the translation in the English is not a very good translation. Remember I told you that the Hebrew and the Greek have what's called a semantic range of words. 
Now the words that are used here for, for her, the, word, the Hebrew word is rak, and that's translated in English as weak, but in, in the Hebrew it's not, the, the, the greatest use of that word is not weak. The greatest use of that word is tender. The second greatest word is gentle. And then it goes on from there, soft or mild. This is why we got to go into the original languages. I heard someone say that she could have been cross-eyed, right? When you think of weak eyes, she could have been cross-eyed. There was something wrong with her, with her eyes that caused you not to want her, right? And that's not the case. Bless you. That's not the case. Some say that she had beautiful eyes. Some say that she had beautiful eyes, the eyes of someone that looked, looked much younger. That's what one person said. Another commentator says this, and I, and I kind of like this one. Another commentator says that she had no fire or sparkle in her eyes. Now, this is something that people would have said, or well, commentators say that in the Middle East, this is something that was prized in, the, in those times, was that fire, that little bit of spunk that would have been in her eyes. Now, this was highly prized in that culture. But the next seems to imply, the next part of this text seems to imply that she was unattractive, okay? Now, some commentators say that, that she was just ugly, and you know, they're pretty, they're pretty strong in their language, but I don't think it was necessarily that she was ugly, uh, or true that she was ugly. I don't think that, we, that she was extremely beautiful, uh, because the, of what the text says. Now, I'm going to tell you something a little funny also, coming from the text. Leah means cow. <laughs> and Rachel means you, female lamb. Now, that description has nothing to do with their looks, <laughs> okay? Has absolutely nothing to do with their looks. As a matter of fact, what it could be is that the father was a rich man, and he may, probably named them after his riches, you know? And a man was known by his riches by of uh, his flock and his animals during this time, okay? But let me go further. Now, her sister, on the other hand, is described as being extraordinarily beautiful, right? Very beautiful. How do we know this? Because it says that she was beautiful in form and face. Her body, we're not talking about her face, we're talking about her body was very attractive. Her face was beautiful, according to the Hebrew text. In our language, we would say that she was absolutely gorgeous. So when Laban asked <laughs> Jacob what he wanted his wages to be, the, and we'll just put it this way, the natural man wants natural things. So based, basically, in one word, he said, Rachel. I want Rachel. This wasn't in common. In those times, um, God allowed for marriage to be done this way up to where change was in, in the Levitical law. But one thing I want you to notice also right here is this guy, he didn't even, <laughs> this guy, he didn't even consider how he was going to eat and live. He, uh, he offers his service for seven years. Seven years for Rachel. He says, I'll work for you for seven years. Do you know what that entails? Seven years of work. Where right now we're going to, in a few minutes, we're going to break this down for you, how much he was actually paying for Rachel. But, he, but how was he going to live? I, was he like young kids today? Well, I'm going to pay the bills right here, but you got to feed me. <laughs> you got to pay for my food, right? Now, it says there in verse 18 that he loved Rachel. He loved her. Now, commentators say this, and I want you guys to get the, the notion of what's going on here, but he was absolutely love-struck. He was love-sick. And you can hear it in the deal that he makes with his uncle. When a man wanted to, to a woman in those days, there was to be paid what's called a dowry price. 
right? That dowry price was to be paid to the father for the woman, and, and this was just in case anything happened, there was a divorce, then that woman would be taken care of and brought back. There was compensation for that. Now, De Deuteronomy 22, 29 places the maximum dowry price on a woman at 50 shekels, okay? 50 shekels, and that was the maximum. The typical bride price, well, the, the average bride price was only 30 to 40 shekels, okay? And that was a, a, a typical shepherd would make about... 10 shekels a year, okay? So 10 times seven is what? 70. The bride price is what at a maximum? 50. Another commentator says that some even made up to 18 shekels a year, okay? And you could do the math yourself, but how do we know that Jacob was, was completely intoxicated with this Rachel? How do we know? He offers his labor for seven years. Now, if he paid uh, up to 18 shekels a year times seven for this woman, he's paying three or four times the maximum amount, right? It kind of reminds you of Hosea when, they, when uh, Gomer, his wife, was sent into slavery. He pays the highest price for her. Do you guys remember them? But he loves her this much. He loves her so much that he's willing to pay three or four times the maximum amount for Rachel. Seven years worth of work. Why does he do this? Looking back at Jacob's childhood, childhood he was rejected by his father. Now we see who he is. Now he has nothing he doesn't even have his father's love. He doesn't have his mother's love. His, he's on his brother's hit list, right? He can't go home. His brother wants to get him. So his life has no meaning. And so I, here, here's, a life, here's a life lesson that we're going to learn from the text right here. It's kind of like this English saying that if we could only have that, it would fix all my problems. Have you guys ever heard that saying before? And so what do we do in our lives. We try to, we try to live by that, right? Our, we, we try to meet our goals, meet our achievements, because if I only have that, my life is going to be better. And you're going to learn a great lesson today about that. You're going to learn a, a very big lesson today. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, says this, the longings which arise in us when we first fall in love or first, first think of some foreign country or first take up some subject that excites us are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can ever really satisfy. There is always something we have grasped for or at. Therefore, always, there's always something in that first moment of longing that fades away in reality. The spouse may be a good spouse. Your spouse may be a fantastic spouse. The, sc the scenery has been uh, excellent. And it turned out to be good a good job, but it evades us. In the morning, it's always Leia. And I want you guys to write that down. In the morning, it's always Leia. There's a problem here that we're going to encounter. We want things. And we get so wrapped up in those things that it totally consumes us. Again, how do we know that, that this was going on with, uh, with Jacob? He was lovesick. His whole world was starting to revolve around one woman, and her name was Rachel. Genesis 29, 20 again says, So Jacob served for seven years. This is how lovesick he was. Seven years he served for Rachel, and they seemed to be a few days to him because he loved her so much. Love sick. But now Jacob's deceived, deceived, and we're going to see that in Genesis 29, 21 through 30. And let's read that for a moment. And read along with me because I want you guys to see this. I changed some of the words because they're a little explicit. We have kids here, but I'm going to say it another way. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my time is completed, that I may be a husband to her. Laban gathered all the men 
of the feet, the place, and made a feast. Now in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him, and Jacob was a husband to her. Laban also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came about in the morning that, behold, it was who? Was it Rachel? Who was it? Leah. I say Leah, you say Leah. <laughs> Leah, Leah, potato, potato, right? So, Laban, and we got a, another great uh, uh, lesson right here. When he wakes up, he confronts Laban. He confronts Laban, and he says, What have you done to me? Was it not Rachel that I served with you? Why then have you deceived me? But Laban said, It is not the practice. And this was, a, this was a, a sorry excuse if I ever heard one. It is not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Uh, it, it's true. It's true. But that, that wasn't a, a very good excuse. And then he says this, complete the week. A week was considered seven, right? Seven years is what a week means here. So complete the, one, the week of this one, and I will give you the other for, a, for the service which you shall serve with me for another seven years. That's a long time. Seven years he worked for Rachel. Jacob did, not, did so and completed her week another seven years. Fourteen years for Rachel. Fourteen years. And he gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Laban also gave his maid Bilhah to, to his daughter Rachel as her maid. So Jacob went and became a husband to Rachel. And indeed her love, his love, or he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban another seven years. Fourteen years. Fourteen years. One commentator said, Jacob's attitude was not normal for his time. He says, because during this time in antiquity, people got married for status, not for love. People were put together in marriages. He wanted to get married to Rachel for love. Right? And this is pretty neat to hear and to understand. And you'll notice that he's doing something very dangerous here. And husbands and wives, I want you to hear this. What is he doing? He's making Rachel his whole world. Listen, beloved, the Bible commands us to love our spouses and to give them your affections and not to give your affections to any other human being outside of that marriage, right? In that sense. But when you make them your number one before God, you commit idolatry. And spouses, if you're the opposite and you command that in your spouse make you number one, you set yourself in the place of God and you violate God himself. Idolatry is a great, great sin before God. First place belongs to one and one alone. And who is it? God Almighty. God Almighty. When you put your children first, you commit idolatry. When you put your job first, you commit idolatry. Understand this. Jacob demanded his, his wife from Laban because he worked seven years for her. But do you recall what the original agreement was? Laban never gave a solemn agreement. All he said was that it was better that I give her to you than some other man. He didn't say yes to the agreement. He never gave a seal the deal kind of agreement. There's nothing recorded here. So Laban devised a plan. Remember that, that stone on that well? Remember that brute strength? R.C. Sproul says this. He says that Laban, when Rebecca, because Rebecca was Laban's sister, when she was being given to Isaac, Abraham's servant dressed her in jewelry and it attracted Laban, already showing his heart. This brute strength of Rebecca's son attracted him also. 
and wanted him to work for him. Think about it. Deception. Deception. So Laban devised a plan. Listen to what he does. There was a wedding, and I already told you what your... I, I, already, I, I explained this, but you're going to have a question now, right? There was a wedding that went on. And I'm going to answer the question for you before I ask, before you even think of asking. How did Jacob not know that he was marrying Leah? How did he not know that it wasn't Rachel? Now let's go back to antiquity for a moment. In antiquity, women on their wedding day were heavily veiled all day during this wedding until the night she was given away. Okay, heavily veiled, covered up from head to toe. Now there's some uh, other commentators that say this. When Leah was given to him, he was what they say, what they call inebriated. They drank wine. He was tipsy, okay? He lived in a tent, no electricity, drunk, in the dark, and this is very important, drunk and in the dark, he thought he married Leah. Your next question is, how did he not know once they got into this place? And, and again, it was dark. But there's some strong suggestions here uh, coming from some uh, commentators that it was, in fact, uh, wine. Okay, because when he woke up in the morning, <laughs> he woke up kind of groggy and said, looking over his shoulder and waking up, what did he say? What in the world is this? What have I done? What is Leah doing here? Right? And those were the strong suggestions to use of liquor. <laughs> right? So we're going to move on just a little bit further here because there's some lessons that we're going to learn here about what happened this night. The text gives us the notion that when he wakes up that he was possibly drunk the night before. He confronts Laban for his treachery. What does Laban tell him? Laban gives him again this, this excuse, well, well look, in our culture, in our, in our town, the way we do it around here, is the older goes before the younger. Jacob could have contested it, but you don't even see that in Scripture. He does not contest. He does not contest. Does that cause you to, to question that? He does not contest it. He could have. He could have contested. He could have did what his brother was doing to him. He could have chased Laban down and wanted to kill him too. This was injustice. But the odd thing is that he didn't contest it. Laban tells Jacob it is the practice in our place to marry off the, the it is not the play, practice in our place to offer the younger before the firstborn. And Jacob uses a word right here. Why have you deceived me? Now if you look a couple chapters back, the same word de uh, deceived was used when he deceived his father when he deceived his father. And some great commentators pulled some stuff out right here that I want to share with you. A man by the name of Robert Alter says this. He says, this is surmise. But what surmise? That it must have occurred to Jacob that Laban had only done to him what he had done to his father. In the dark, he thought he was touching Rachel as his father in the dark. Remember, Isaac was blind or going blind. As, in, as his father in the dark of his blindness had, uh, blindness had thought he was touching Esau. Alter then quotes an, an ancient rabbinical commentator who imagines the conversation that day between Jacob and Leah. Jacob says to Leah, and this is an imagination of an ancient commentator, he says, I called out to Rachel in the dark and you answered, why did you do that to me? And Leah says to him, your father called out Esau in the dark and you answered, why did you do that to him? 
This may have been the reason why he didn't contest. His sin was brought before him. What he had done to his father, God did back to him. Remember, Hebrews tells us that if you are the Lord's, that he will chastise you. Remember, he was in the line of the Messiah. Fury for Laban dies quickly on his lips. Cut to the quick, suddenly the evil that he had done to his father now comes to Jacob. And he sees what it's like to be manipulated and deceived. Remember, Jacob is considered the deceiver. And now he's the one being deceived by a master manipulator, right? And so quietly, he meekly picks up another seven years. Didn't even contest. He worked another seven years. Isn't that crazy? And it's very possible that this is what happened. We look to Jacob and Rachel and we see, and we can see that they, they were victimized by Laban, right? You can say that they were victims. You would want to say that they were victims for his greed and because of his selfishness. But I don't think that there was anyone more victimized than the woman named Leah. No one was more victimized than Leah. So when Jacob became husband to Rachel, verse 30 says, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban for another seven years. Seven years he was married to Leah. He was married to her for seven whole years, and Jacob was not in love with that woman. You think about that for a moment. And then this Leah, who was unloved, rejected, unwanted, and I want you, again, I want you to think about this. She had to live in the shadows of her beautiful younger sister. Laban probably did what he did because if Leah was unattractive, she didn't have that spark in her eye. He couldn't get her married to anybody, so you know what he did? He pushed her on Jacob. Some have suggested that. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever read this scripture and ever had a real thread of concern about what that woman Leah was going through? This kills your heart when you think about it. There's a world of destruction already in this one family. Leah was thrown on a man who didn't want her. She was thrown on a man who didn't love her. And her father purposely did this to her. She felt rejected by her, by her own dad. If there's anyone who felt unwanted, unloved, to the maximum degree and rejected, in this story, it was Leah. She was the one who was rejected. So what does she do? She does what they do. She sets her heart on Jacob. Jacob had set his heart on Rachel, just like Isaac had set his heart on Esau. Remember in the commandments it says, I will visit the iniquities of the fathers down to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. And, we, and, I, and I tell you guys about this generational thing that spills on over to the next people for those who live in sin, right? We're seeing something of that right here. So what does she do to win Jacob's love? We're, we're coming to a close right here soon. Here we're going to see Leah's faith brought out. Now the Lord, in verse 31, saw that Leah was unloved, and he opened her womb. Listen to the words. He saw that she was unloved, and he opened her womb, but Rachel, he caused her to be barren. She was loved. Rachel, uh, Leah wasn't. Leah conceived and bore a son and named him Reuben, for she said, because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved. He has therefore given me a son also, so that she named him Simeon. 
She conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me. Listen to the language of Leah. All she wants is the love from her husband. Because I have bore him three sons, he's got to love me. Therefore, he was named Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah. Then she stopped bearing. Now, here we go. 14 years between these two mentioned uh, marriages, and you've only heard the mention of Yahweh once before, 14 years ago, right? At the beginning of the marriage, and now, once again, Yahweh, the one true God, steps into the scene. Leah was unloved and unwanted, and the Lord, the Lord saw it. The Lord saw it. And what did he do? He opened her womb and closed Rachel's. Rachel was not able to bear children. God gave Leah the greatest status, the greatest status a woman could have in that society, and that was to be fruitful and to multiply. Leah conceived and bore a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, again, because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. And I find it amazing that in this text, Jacob is not mentioned as the husband, although he is the husband, I mean the father of, he's not mentioned as the father, but he is the father of these children, but he's not mentioned. He's not mentioned. Look at the text. He's not mentioned as the father. Why the name Reuben? The name Reuben, remember the Lord saw her affliction, and so she directs her attention with the hope of winning his love. The name Reuben means, look, a son. Look, a son. I gave you a son. Oh, he's got to love me. Guess what? Still no love. Still no love. Then she conceived and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he said, Therefore, give me this son also. She named him Simeon. What does Simeon mean? It's derived from the Hebrew word to hear. In this case, the Lord has heard that she was unloved. This shows a deep and bitter disappointment in her heart at the failure of Jacob to accept her despite the birth of a second son. Still, guess what? No love. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. Therefore, he was named Levi. This poor woman was doing all that she can just to get her husband to love her. The name Levi in the Hebrew means attached or joined. People ask, is it possible to have a functioning marriage without love? Yes. You see it right here. There's marriages that are, are in a full-blown uh, function, a full-blown functioning marriage and there's no love there. Can't, is it possible? Yes. And you see it here. It makes you wonder, if he didn't love Leah, why did he keep giving this woman children? Why did he keep giving her children? She gave that man three sons, and that still did not move his heart. And guess what? She was still unloved. Listen to me. Being loved or being successful will never enable us to flourish as human beings. You may think you will. You may think those things will cause you to flourish, but they won't. It is, there is only one thing that can cause you to flourish. It is only God that satisfies our deepest longings. I told you that whole story just to bring you to this one verse. Up to this point, Leah tried to win the affection of a man who didn't love her. And what did she do here? She tried in her own strength over and over. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Do you want to know what do you want to know what she said? I'm not going to give my heart to this man anymore. He doesn't love me. He doesn't want me. She conceived again and bore a son, and this is what she said. This time. I will praise the Lord. This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, therefore she named him Judah. Do you know what the name Judah means? It means 
I will praise Yahweh. And guess what? She didn't need Jacob to love her because the Lord, when she set her heart upon him first, not on her husband first, on him first, he became her husband. And the Lord closed her womb at that moment. She had other children later, but from at this point, she closed her womb. Later, we learn that Rachel gave birth to Joseph and Benjamin. You guys remember who they were? Joseph became uh, a leader in Egypt, brought his family out of Egypt, oh, to Egypt, and Moses brought him out. You know that she had a son named Benjamin that was a, he was a highly prized son, too, by Isaac. Listen to this. But it was not given to Rachel what was given to Leah. The son of Judah, this one child, was the messianic line of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It didn't come from Rachel. It came from Leah. It came through Judah. Who, who is Jesus? Jesus comes from the tribe of what? Judah. Genesis 49.10 says this, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff between his feet, until Shiloh, this is the Messiah, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Not only did Jesus, the Messiah, come from his greater mother, Leah, but also the Levites, Moses and Aaron, came from Leah, not from Rachel. Can you believe that the Messiah would come from Leah? A woman who was unwanted and unloved, rejected. Our Lord is truly the father of the fatherless. He is truly the husband of the husbandless. It's because of verses like this that I believe that the Lord has a special care and love for affection and affection like Leah. Later the Messiah would come from her, from her line. And just like Leah before him, Isaiah 53 says this. Listen to the language. For, and they're, they're talking about Jesus here. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form. He was not attractive. Jesus. Nor majesty that we should look upon him. Nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Yet it was through this man who was despised and rejected among men, his own creation, in whom salvation came from. He was rejected. We see a picture of the gospel here with Leah. This unloved and unwanted woman ended up being a great woman of beauty because true beauty is not found in the outward appearance. Where is it found? In the heart. This woman loved God. Once she took her eyes off of her husband and, made him, and quit making him first, Put her eyes on Christ, or put her eyes on Yahweh, and made him first. Then she was truly blessed. I'm going to end here in Matthew 5, 3. You guys remember the Beatitudes? I want you to hear the compassion of God here in the Beatitudes, and listen to this great compassion. Blessed are the, are the proud? No. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Where do you find your, your uh, fullness of heart? You find it in Christ. You don't find it in the world. The world will give you a big, gaping hole in your heart. Christ 
is the only one that can give you fulfillment. Let's go ahead and bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the study that you've given us. We thank you for all the mothers here today. Pray, O oh Lord, that this word right here that you've given us today would be a great help to each and every mother. For all those mothers who, who uh, have a hard life, Father, I know my own wife does too, but for all the mothers here, they do a lot. These women really are super women with the things that they do, the things that they set aside. These women, these women, oh Lord, put their selves aside for others. And I, I've always noticed this since I became a believer, that their humility is great. These women, O oh Lord, are, are examples to us men because very easily they set their selves aside for us. O oh Lord, may these women show us the example of what humility looks like. May we see the humility of Leah and the strength of her faith as an example to us today. In Jesus' name, amen.